Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, welcome back to the Better Sex Podcast. This is Jessa, and I'm so glad you're here. Today's conversation is really interesting. I'm talking to Kathy Slaughter about the importance, the utility of pleasure in healing from trauma, childhood trauma. You know, whether that's sexual trauma or not, their premise is that trauma fundamentally cuts us off from ourselves and that getting into our bodies, into sensory experience and prioritizing ourselves and what feels good, tuning into that is a core part of getting to a place where you are thriving post-trauma, not just surviving. And they share their own journey around some of this, but also their work with clients and how much this comes up and some of the tips and homework and approaches that people can take in terms of integrating trauma, pursuing it, giving yourself permission for that, enjoying it, finding it, all those things. But then also how to use this with a partner, a relationship, an intimate relationship can be the optimal way to finally feel safe and trust if you've got a partner who's got that capacity. So hopefully you're gonna get a ton out of the conversation. I really thought it was fascinating. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. So, Kathy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited about this topic, this idea of linking pleasure and trauma (laughs) or trauma recovery or trauma processing, or I'm not even quite sure how I want to say it, but I'd be curious to hear where your interest in this came from. Was it just purely out of what was showing up in your office or or is it something more than that? This comes from the most selfish motives you can imagine. (laughs) Okay. Um, Actually, I am a childhood trauma survivor myself. In many different ways. Okay. And so my own quest to heal trauma is part of how I became a therapist. Okay. And has then informed the type of therapist that I am and the things that I specialize in and the work that I've pursued. So I got into the field to work with other women and young girls who'd been to hell and back too many times before the age of 20 and started off working with domestic violence and then did some community-based work, drug, drug and alcohol work. And I've been in private practice for about a decade now. And that was when I first decided to actually specialize in trauma officially. Yeah. <laughs> behind my name and everything. And then about seven years in, I started working with people who were struggling with gender identity. And also met someone who was working as a sex educator and became very interested in sexuality and moved into that as my next specialty. And it was through embracing pleasure within the sexual realm that I became turned on to the notion of what pleasure can do for trauma survivors, starting with myself and then moving out to my clients and my community. So is that something that you had already sort of experienced and identified before even becoming a therapist? Are you saying this was additional sort of healing for yourself once you started working professionally? Okay. Additional. Yeah. I went through a pretty deep round of therapy in my early 20s um, when I was in college was kind of the first dance I did with my history. And then I entered into another pretty serious round of therapy about six years ago in alignment with some other changes in my personal life that really were much more focused on sex and gender. And that experience is really what has brought me to where I am now. Because I think when you go through trauma, at whatever age, the system, our system, our bodies, our minds respond with survival strategies to keep us safe and to keep us alive. 
And I think when that trauma hits when you're younger or if it hits very frequently, it can become a permanent way of being. Mm. And so you're kind of going through life in survival mode. And that has some strengths. It also has some serious <laughs> weaknesses. And the the part that I found them... So I, I, I think about my own trauma recovery in two pieces right now. There was that initial recognizing this happened to me, validating that this had happened to me, unpacking what that meant, reckoning with that initial onslaught of unprocessed emotion in my 20s. And I feel like that took me from like survival to like okayness. Okay. You know, like I could cope with life. I was doing okay most of the time. Things were fine. And then as I got into the second round of therapy and recovery, I feel like I've moved from okay to thriving. And I really think any trauma survivor is capable of moving from surviving to thriving. And they also feel like very different pieces of the recovery process. Right. Right. Because there's a heck of a lot of work to be done sometimes to get from survival to okay. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, And just getting to okay felt amazing. I bet. (laughs) Where I am now is beyond where my wildest dreams were 20 years ago when I first got into therapy in college. And would you, I mean, two different questions. I'm not sure which one to ask first. I'll ask them both and then you can decide. (laughs) Is the use of sensual pleasure appropriate in both of those stages? Or do you think it's really more better fitted going from okay to thriving? And then is it as just as relevant whether your trauma was sexual abuse of some sort, sexual trauma, or does it apply for like any sort of trauma? Both great questions. I think it shows up in both parts of the healing journey. It just shows up a little bit differently the first time. I think if my college era therapist had suggested I engage in pleasure, I would have looked at her like she was speaking Greek. Where I started when I was getting past survival mode was learning how to soothe myself. Mm. And it turns out that a lot of activities that are soothing are also pleasurable. (laughs) And that's part of why they're soothing. Right, right, right. But to frame it in terms of pleasure would have been just astronomically beyond my comprehension. Okay. In the beginning. Yeah. But things like taking a hot bath, enjoying a hot cup of tea, a conversation with a friend, a walk in the woods, these kinds of things soothe me because they are pleasurable. Yeah. Yeah. And in my later healing and recovery, the more that I acknowledge that it's pleasure and the more that I've put a value on seeking pleasure, the more of a resource that that pool of self-soothing and self-care strategies has become for me. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's relevant for anyone who's a trauma survivor because the the piece that I see across my people, which includes some folks who are sexually abused, but also includes a lot of people who just had like a parent with undiagnosed and untreated bipolar disorder. Right, right. For example, in all of my clients and in myself, what I see trauma do at its most fundamental level is it breaks their ability to relate to themselves. Mm. So this sense of like this core sense of me that I can ground into, that I can relate to, that I nourish, that I look after, that I set boundaries around, like that whole part of being human is knocked offline. Okay. And so the ways in which it's knocked offline and the processes that people go through to get that connection back in place can look very different depending on what kind of trauma they've been through, but it's the same process fundamentally in my mind. Okay. Because trauma affects people's ability to feel safe. Just like fundamentally. Right. Right here, right now, I'm safe. It affects their ability to trust themselves and other people, which makes it really hard to understand what's going on around you, what's going on within you and respond to it, which means it also affects your sense of confidence, your sense of power and the ability to impact the world around you. And so without a sense of safety, without an ability to trust, without belief that you can impact the world around you, how in the hell are you going to be intimate with someone else? Yeah. And that's different than how the hell are you going to have sex with somebody else, right? Yeah. And I think about pleasure very broadly. For me, pleasure is a facet of my everyday life, or at least I try to make it that way. (laughs) It's still very much a work in progress. It's also worth noting here that we all also reckon with collective and legacy traumas in our life as well. And so I would say after 2020, we're a planet full of trauma survivors right, at this right. point. And so there's also a lot of aspects of our culture, especially 
here in America that makes pleasure suspect, I would say, Mm -hmm. Uh, at least here in the Midwest where I am. Church is still incredibly important. And a lot of things that are pleasurable are also associated with sin. And so even for people that I know who aren't still practicing in those traditions, there's still this uneasy relationship with something that feels good, even if you're not really a trauma survivor. Yeah. And so I find there's just an incredible power in trying to shift that focus and saying, no, I'm going to do this thing because it feels good. And that's a piece that I think we all struggle with. Yeah. And is that just a matter of practice to get, I mean, does, does that get easier the more you do it? So like, I'm just, it, because I imagine, I know in my own clients would be people that really resist. I, I can't mm. do it because it feels good. You know, is that like something you just sort of make yourself do and it gets easier? That's kind of how I did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not going to lie. I had everybody and their brother around me for many years telling me to slow down, to cut myself some slack to take care of myself. And for a long time, I did just kind of take it on faith that like the self-care thing I'm doing is worthwhile. So I'll keep (laughs) doing it, I guess. You know, it's not taking a hot bath and saying that is an accomplishment for the day. Sure as hell is a low bar to hit, but it took some fake it till you make it for me, Mm -hmm. for sure. I've had some clients echo similar sentiments, but I think the piece that's really interesting is not all that far into starting some kind of self-care or some kind of pleasure practice, it starts to take over and you start to see really strong benefits from the action that you're taking. Hmm. And at that point, it can start to feel real, but it can still, there are still pieces of the trauma of the intrusions of the things that are blocking that connection with self that will still show up. And sometimes depending on the nature of your trauma, Pleasurable context can be incredibly triggering. To use myself as an example, one of my major ahas a few years ago in my own therapy was realizing that I found a certain level of happiness triggering because I'd had so many experiences of feeling really elevated and then being put in my place in some way oh. on purpose and incidental. And so I would I would experience this incredibly joyful thing and then be just an absolute triggered mess. And that was when I was like, whoa, okay, wait a minute. (laughs) I prefer not to be triggered by happiness. Let's unpack this. (laughs) But it was, it was weird. It was fundamentally weird. And it was not something I expected to encounter. Yeah. So I certainly appreciate when trauma survivors are like, so this pleasurable thing, this is hard. Because it's weird. It feels weird in your body. It seems like a strange thing to prioritize. And like I said, we have a lot of cultural conditioning that says right. hedonism is bad for you. So I'm I'm sitting here thinking, OK, there's pleasure in a general sense about putting myself first. What do I actually want? Like in a psychological or emotional kind of space. But but how specifically are you talking about like physical pleasure, like sensory with our body, mm-hmm. you know, pleasure? Like what's the role of that specifically and within pleasure more broadly? I'm going to go back to my original training as a cognitive behavioral therapist for a minute, because one of my foundations of how I work as a therapist is I think about people in terms of thoughts and behaviors and which end do we play with first. And one of the lovely things about being human is our brains and our body like to be in sync with each other. So some of my clients going after their thoughts is really effective and we can unpack a lot of stinking thinking as we colloquially call it. (laughs) And really start to shift how they're feeling as a result of shifting how they're thinking. For some people, that is just running your head against a brick wall. And there are also, I think, some parts of healing that just aren't cognitively based, no matter how much we want them to be. And that's where the behavioral piece comes in. And with that piece, I will very consciously coach my clients to slow down, you know, and I'll start listening for fleeting moments where they kind of talk, you know, mention as an aside, something that was good for them or something that they enjoyed. I listen for those and I'll call them back their attention and be like, Hey, did you notice when you were talking about gardening just now, like how much your face lit up? Cause I sure did. And really like I've given homework that's like, give yourself the most amazing, luxurious bubble bath experience you can create. And tell me how it goes. And especially when I'm working with couples that have been struggling with intimacy, often in my work so far, typically the lower desire couple is 
a more type A intellectually wired type of person. And so sometimes getting to intimacy in an erotic sense, the easier pathway is to help that person start to notice their body and notice themselves as an animal physical creature with everyday things. So that way, when they get to the bedroom, it doesn't feel like such a jarring transition to go from this very intellectual, upright, executive functioning person to this silly, writhing, pleasure filled, sweaty <laughs> mess in the bed. Like that's that's kind of a leap when you think about it. Yeah. Well, you talked about trauma sort of fundamentally cutting us off from ourselves. And, I, and it makes me think part of that severing is between our body our physical self and our, mm -hmm. our head or something, right? Because people talk about I'm all up in my head or there's some disconnect from my body. And it just seems like the utility of asking people to have sensual felt sense pleasure would be really mm -hmm. connecting again. It is. It is actually a simple intervention that I learned um, from a classmate in grad school, actually, is you know using a small chocolate like a Hershey Kiss as an exercise in the consulting room and, and saying, mm -hmm. okay, like, we're going to take the last 15 minutes of session here to really enjoy this piece of chocolate. And I watch my clients look at me like I've lost my mind, <laughs> um, <laughs> but they are usually good sports. And yeah, and just walking them through, like really examining what this chocolate looks like and taking time to unfold it and examine it again and smell it and anticipate it and notice that you're salivating and then to take a bite of the chocolate and spend that kind of intention with it can be a really great way to help clients who are cut off at the neck start to, to recognize there's more going on down here. Hey, we're going to just take a short little break here. And I want to let you know about Intimacy with Ease, the method that helps otherwise happy couples create a sex life that is fun, easy, light for both people. So if you are an otherwise happy couple, if sex is the elephant in the room or sex is the little bit of the challenge for you guys, you may want to check this out. Uh, you can go to intimacywithease.com and you'll see information there. You'll see short videos. You'll have access to a full webinar about it. All kinds of information to let you know if this would be the right thing for you. Now, you said pretty quickly these the pleasure practices become reinforcing, mm -hmm. like it starts to make a big difference. What are people likely to experience when they really start to make room and maybe force themselves <laughs> to do things that feel good? <laughs> Sometimes there's an immediate payoff. I think I have um, one client that really hates sweating <laughs> and has never really worked out because of it. And during the plague, they were really struggling with everything as we all have been and they started using their new um, vr equipment game as a workout and for them the payoff from that was immediate because they could dance out and sweat out all of their anxiety so they're like yeah my brain is still going a mile a minute but i'm so exhausted i don't care this is better mm. <laughs> <laughs> and i've had other clients that sometimes will notice that they're sleeping better a sense of um, pressure is often another early release that comes from this kind of practice. And, and also the way I work with pleasure with my clients is also really related to mindfulness. So I'm also building practices of awareness more broadly as well. And those reinforce each other too, because one of the great pleasures of my life is being able to notice beautiful things in nature. And so I appreciate that my mindfulness practices have also given me the ability to be in the present moment enough that I notice an amazing sunset or I notice the falcon that just landed in that tree, which without those practices, I, I know I wouldn't see. So it's also about ideally eventually feeling your inner child coming alive again. Because um, mm. a lot of my clients were wounded when they were children. And yeah. so that part of them that they're disconnected from is a, actually a really young part. And sometimes in the course of, of a pleasurable activity, and like we've got another client in our practice right now, her hobbies that she didn't necessarily connect as a pleasure activity has actually become a great source of resilience for her now that she has. Um, right. So sometimes it's also just helping clients recognize what they're already doing that they're only sort of aware of. 
and strengthening you know, like taking more pleasure from the things that you that are already part of your life, being open to seeing it that way and experiencing that that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So where's, I mean, I'm imagining the bubble bath and the enjoying your hobby and all the stuff, and that's more solo. Mm-hmm. You know, where's the role for pleasure, partnered pleasure <laughs> in terms of this healing journey? Does that have, I mean, does that have to come after some of the individual work? Is this something people can dive into and, and think of sexual pleasure with a partner or sensual pleasure with a partner right away as an opportunity for healing? I think it depends on your partner because some partners are really capable of holding space and being emotionally attuned. And, you know, might be aware of their partner's past, might be aware of their partner's triggers. Partners like that, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> like, <rock on. laughs> that's, that's one of the best places you have. Because I think in the same way that abusive relationships can break our connection to ourselves, there is nothing like a healthy relationship for restoring your connection to yourself. Yeah. Problem is, is we're all drawn to the same things that are already familiar. So the ads of a trauma survivor picking a healthy partner. Oh, simply because simply everyone repeats the same patterns over and over. Just some of us have patterns that aren't actually in our favor. Yeah. So if you have a partner that it's like, there is some capacity there to connect with pleasure, go for it. So it will help improve your relationship as well. And if sexual intimacy feels like too much, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a real strong focus on if the sex is good, the relationship is good. Sex is one part of a relationship. Yeah. I've seen dancing is actually probably one of the most common partnered activities that I see as a resilience factor. Yeah. Um, people that I've worked with, you know, going out to live concerts, those kinds of things, like activities that you and your partner both enjoy in and out of the bedroom. That's all fair game. And I think if you're finding a place where your trauma is getting in the way of being able to be intimate with a partner, that can be a good sign to get into therapy for yourself uh, so that you can digest more of that trauma so it's not getting in the way. And it could also be a good place to get into therapy as a couple so that you can figure out how to help trauma and not get in the way for both of you. Yeah. Um, And like I said, right now, I would say we're a planet full of trauma survivors. So we're all in a place where sex might feel a little more challenging or a little more out out of reach. There was a study done in the U.S. late last year that showed a real increase in solo pleasure and a decrease in coupled partnered pleasure. Yeah. And there's a about 10 to 20 percent of folks that are like, hey, this telehealth not going commuting thing. This is great. I'm good. But there's more like 20 to 25 percent of people who are like, I'm really stressed out and I have no interest in sex. Thanks. Yeah. So I think at this particular moment in time, sex and pleasure can feel really out of reach and elusive simply because, as I was saying to one of my clients the other day, we've been in this really stimulus-deprived context right. for over a year. Right. And so the other the other thing I love about pleasure is there's no, are you doing it right? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I think is a consequence of being cut off at the neck is a lot of my clients are very preoccupied with whether they're doing something right or is this reasonable or am I off the deep end here with pleasure? It doesn't matter. Like literally if it feels good, you're congrats. You're doing it right. Right, right, right. Do you want it to feel better? Okay. Figure out some way to make it 5% more pleasurable, but that that's really the barometer. Right. You know? And, and I think when it comes to sex, we tend to get like concerned about performance and intercourse and orgasm and, and like all these other things that are beautiful when they occur, but don't really work well as outcomes. And so would hope for anyone that's partnered, that partnership is strong enough that you can enjoy the pleasure of a couple, you know, holding hands, sitting on the couch, watching TV. So for people that are coupled, what are some of the, I don't know if I want to say intricacies or differences or strategies or concerns or whatever, if both people have had trauma or if only one has, like those seem like two different situations. Like, I don't, I don't know what you'd say about tips and tricks for either situation, maybe. Yeah. If both of you have trauma histories, have fun. And I say that with all sincerity. One of my partners is also a trauma survivor. And so I've done the trauma survivor in relationship with trauma survivor thing. And in some ways it is absolutely magical because those two people are going to understand each other in a way that is rare and beautiful. It's also really challenging because if your damage is at all similar, you will trigger each other. Yeah. And what I find with 
when you've got two trauma survivors in the room is how do you get to a place where both parties feel safe enough to be ex- expressive mm-hmm. and intimate and take risks? Because in a partnership where you've got one trauma survivor and one not so much, the not so much partner can often become the secure base. Right. Hold that space. Right. Partner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When both of you have been traumatized, you're both doing that for each other. This is one of my theories for the phenomenon known as lesbian bed death, because the odds of two femme gendered humans not both being trauma survivors are pretty small. Ah, uh, interesting. So just as an aside, I think that might be a factor that we don't talk about because I think one of the things that in either case can be tricky is the ability to be present and accepting with your partner's experience without expectations. Because I think for a lot of us, sex by itself feels really intense and personal and emotional and vulnerable. And so When your partner declines making out, it feels more tender than if your partner declines watching a movie, even though they're both just activities that you could engage in together. Sex has this extra tenderness to it, wherever it comes from. And so what can often happen, especially if the partner you're with is a sex abuse survivor, arousal itself becomes a trigger. Like I was talking about happiness being a trigger earlier. Yeah, yeah. It's like, let's talk about what we don't want to see happen. Trauma survivor gets triggered. Partner notices the trigger and takes it personally and freaks out. And now the trauma survivor is even in worse shape. And sex just became a disaster. (laughs) On the other hand, if your partner has digested a fair amount of their trauma and they kind of know what their triggers are going to look like when you see it happen, hopefully that partner can respond from a place of, okay, this isn't about me. How do I move in to help soothe my partner? And maybe we can soothe and get back in the sack. And maybe this is where this encounter ends. And just being at peace with that. Yeah. I I think, and I think that's true, true for all parties is to release that attachment of what any given intimate encounter is going to contain, not contain, feel like, do. The more of that you can release and just enjoy being present with one another the better it's going to work. Anything I have forgotten to ask you that you want to make sure to talk about? I want to talk a little bit about trauma triggers, the fight, flight, freeze, spawn pathway and how that can show up in the bedroom. Okay. If your traumatized partner is someone who tends to respond by fighting and you trigger them in the bedroom, they're likely to bite your head off. Oh, wow. You know, they're likely to, to, to suddenly snap and, oh, don't touch me that way. Yeah. Are you doing it wrong? You know, but they might be triggered. That might be their fight response. Okay. A partner who has more of a tendency to flee might be more averse to sex. So they might be the partner that like every time you're trying to seduce them, they're like pulling away from you, but they're not saying anything. They might be triggered. A partner who has a tendency to fawn, I'd keep an eye out for them going along with things in a very passive, docile, submissive, I'll use that word loosely, kind of way. Because they might be in their fallen response. They might be in, in a place where all they want to do is make you happy, but it's coming from a survival place, not an authentic desire to please you kind of place. And then for a partner who freezes, you want to look for signs of dissociation. You know, So if you're going at it and things seem great, and then like they're suddenly not really moaning like they were or their body language changes you want to check in and visually like their face might look kind of blank they may not really be focusing on you anymore and if you simply like taking a pause in the action doesn't get a response from them you want to check in verbally and if they don't respond at that point you want to stop because at that point the person that you're in bed with their body's in the bed but they ain't there so i think that that's a simple way to think about how triggers might show up in the bedroom too Right. And is it, I guess I'll ask the question, is it the partner's job to be on high alert for these signs of triggers? Like where, where's the responsibility or, or how would you address that? Because I, I think it's sort of both and, but I'd be curious what you would say to a partner who's like, that's a lot of responsibility for me to figure out if my partner is triggered. And, yeah, I do and, look and now I'm just on eggshells all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a both and. And with my work as a trauma therapist and also my work uh, in the community, as a consent education and accountability facilitator, I've thought about this a lot. Mm-hmm. And 
the way I think about it is percentages of responsibility. And so the person who's initiating the activity, uh, like we were sitting in the same room and I were to reach out and touch your shoulder, like the responsibility is primarily on me because I'm the initiator. I'm the one who, like, you don't even know that I'm thinking about touching your shoulder. Right, right. right. So if you're the initiator, it's on you to get the initial consent. And it remains primarily your responsibility to keep an eye out. However, the other person that you're interacting with should be a full-fledged adult of their own with their own agency and their own responsibility to look out for themselves at all times. Yeah. Because there is no point in our lives. Well, okay. If you've been knocked out under anesthesia for surgery, you probably aren't responsible for looking out for your own safety. But I would say by and large, part of being an adult is being responsible for your own well-being. And that doesn't mean that if something goes wrong and something happens to you that was outside of your control, that doesn't mean you're responsible for it in a a sense of blame placing. Right, right. But I, I like thinking about responsible in the sense of able to respond. So know a partner, you know, if 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 you're going at it and you realize your partner dissociated 20 minutes ago after you've climaxed and rolled off. That's not a great outcome. You're also not now a rapist. Yeah. You know, your partner agreed to initiate the activity. The trigger happened while you were in the activity. It sucks that you weren't able to respond in the moment and stop. It also doesn't make you a rapist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the the thing that seems tricky in here is somebody who's triggered or a trauma survivor who's still in, you know, working towards recovery from this doesn't quite have all that capacity. Mm -hmm. take care of themselves the way that we would hope somebody would. Right. And I, I don't want to put the responsibility on their partner, like, but also they don't, they don't have all that responsibility themselves or that capacity. So it's tricky, right? Like it's a little bit of a balancing act, but I guess I would say it's in the hopes that the trauma survivor will be able to grow into full responsibility for their well-being and taking care of themselves. Right. This is not a permanent, like you got to do this for me. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because I also think part of being an adult is being responsible for your own healing. None of us gets to control what happened to us in the before times, but you're responsible for what you do after it, after at a certain point, somewhere in your twenties that shifts. Yeah. And it it isn't fair for someone to be like, oh, I was abused as a child. So now you have to make sure to look out for these seven different things. No, absolutely not. But also like as a partner, as someone who loves this person, I would hope that you would want to be able to respond in a way that is supportive and soothing and furthers your partner's healing. Yeah. Because I've also seen trauma get compounded when someone got triggered in a sexual encounter and the partner responded badly in a way that echoed previous abuse, like that can really become an emotional avalanche very, very quickly. Well, and based on what you're saying too, about trauma survivors, you know, some likelihood that they're going to pick somebody that isn't, you know, if they haven't done some of that healing work, right, they're going to repeat these patterns and they're picking somebody who's likely to be re-traumatizing. Yes. Anxious types and avoidant types love to partner up together. And it is... As a therapist, I think it's so much fun living through it. I would not necessarily say that. (laughs) Well, I think that even goes beyond trauma. I think that's just human nature. But yeah, our ability to, I always tell couples, our stuff, I can't see my hands on the podcast here, but my fingers go together. Our stuff always just like goes together. And Mm -hmm. it's like this ironic thing, but it is our opportunity for healing too. So yeah, I do think it's interesting that at least every couple's modality that I'm familiar with believes that our really our partnership choices are healing choices yeah uh, and that we we choose unconsciously to partner with someone because part of us is like i can work out my shit with you right <laughs> exactly <laughs> so where can people find you or you know find what you might have to offer we are active on instagram and twitter at soaring heart indie indy and then we are also hosting a conference about polyamory in June. So if they go to ethicalpolyam.com, that's where they can find out more about our practices and principles of ethical polyamory conference in June. And I think that is probably the best way to get a hold of us. I'll put those links in the show notes too. So people don't have to be writing as they're driving or running or whatever they're doing while they're listening. So show notes are a godsend. (laughs) Yes. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.
You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.